very patient with us. God has pardoned us. And now our works follow his pardon to further his what? Eternal kingdom for his glory. We have also found out there is more to heaven than just getting there. We're not just saved just to get there. Listen, there's going to be things we're going to be doing when we get up here to glory. It's going to be awesome. We cannot just settle for salvation and believe we are good. No, 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 no. We should never do that. God has called us to good works. Why? For his ultimate deserved glory. Amen? Isn't that what he did that for us? This is why we all exist, to bring God what? The most glory in everything that we do, everywhere that we go. That's what we're supposed to do. I mean, we're not supposed to be spiritual freaks. I ain't talking about that. I'm talking about living in a life where, think about this, you can lay your head down at night and go straight to sleep because you know your heart is pure. You know what I mean? If you have trouble sleeping at night, evaluate your heart. Check your heart. What's in there? What shouldn't be in there? What is God stirring your heart about that you need to get rid of? And so I want to encourage you. Make sure your heart is pure. He paid it all on the cross. Forgiveness for all. You're going to hear how forgive. And you say, well, there's people out there I can't possibly forgive. I just cannot give them. Forgive them. Huh. I think before you leave here today, you're going to think differently about forgiveness. And I want you to hear me this morning. Lord, as we preach here, we cannot just settle for our salvation. Listen, we got things to do. We, do, we got to follow Jesus, working as he leads us, following our salvation. It's so, so important to bring honor and glory to the one who rescued us from our own sin-filled lives. He truly wants all of us to do what? What does a flower do when it blooms? Of course, those aren't real. All right? But a real flower, it doesn't become a flower. It isn't just, okay, there it is. Right? It grows and it blooms where? Right where it's planted. Are you blooming where you're planted? Are you blossoming where you're planted? Are you radiating the love, the purpose of Jesus Christ where you're planted? In the doctor office and working around those houses, you guys are redoing houses and flipping them and selling them and for good fair prices, I know, because you're godly men. Right? <laughs> And so, you know, are you doing these things? Are we, doing, are we, are we blooming where we're planted? That's what God wants you to do. You're, you're where you are for a reason. That's to bloom Jesus to the world. And I'm not saying being a fruitcake. I'm saying, listen, love Jesus the way he loves you. Right? We treat people the way God has treated us. Isn't that what we're supposed to do? Be kind. Be gentle. Be loving. I know people test your patience. They test mine, too. Sometimes I test my own patience. Sometimes I'm kicking myself like this sometimes, right? Sometimes. Well, we got to test our, hey, listen, we got to, hey, fruit, right? Fruit, love, joy, peace, pain, kind, gentle, self-control. That's all an attributes. One fruit inside of your body as a believer, and you operate in those things. I know you can understand that. It's so, it's easy to understand. Now, as we move in Ephesians, we must see this next series of passages a little bit differently, I want you to see these next series of passages in the correct context for which they're given. Because, you know, you and I sit on this side of the cross. When this was written in the first century, it was very close to the cross. It was very close to a lot of persecution that was taking place between the Romans, between the Jews. And we see this here. And as we go through this ver these verses, I want you to kind of check out this period and, 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 and see how dire the situation was in the first century after Jesus had left planet Earth and the church began to grow and flourish. I mean, Paul's in prison because he's a Christian. In a Roman prison because he's a Christian. Come on, think about this. He's there writing... Glorious letters as God inspires him to write. The Holy Spirit inspires him to write these very words down. This is why we call it the living word. Because every author of, every, of all the 66 books of this Bible, listen, every author was inspired by the living God to write and pen these words. That's why a 1,500-year-old Bible to write with 44 authors and 66 books from cover to cover is intertwined so beautifully from Genesis to maps, Right? Well, Revelations, actually. But anyway, but it's, but it's all God-inspired words. And we need to take them and they're, as they're coming from God to each and every one of us. So, 
to put it in the right context, this is what I wanted to do, so you can kind of relate to what it was, what the relationship between the Romans and the Jews were back in the first century. I want to take you to present-day Afghanistan and Iraq. I want you to think about this for a minute. I want you to think about, I want you to think about ISIS, and I want you to think about Al-Qaeda. And I want you, to, want you to think about how do they think about us as Western civilization? How do they think about the Jews? How does Iran think about the Jews? How, we, how, how do they think? What do they want to do? They want to annihilate us. They want to annihilate the Jews. Listen, that's in their heart. That's, that's, this, is, this, is, this is the seriousness of the first century between the Romans and the Jews. They didn't want to have anything to do. Jews had nothing to do with the Romans. And the Romans would have nothing to do but persecute the Jews and to hold them in their little box, in their little place. Just like ISIS today, you guys saw the gruesome things. They would capture Christians, they would capture Jews, they would capture people who were against them, and what would they do with them? They'd all line them up and they'd cut their heads off, right, and on camera for the whole world to watch. The contention here in this writing, Paul's in prison writing this very thing. And Paul ends his life how? He goes to the chopping block and loses his head. Shortly after he writes these gospels, these, uh, these letters, these prison letters, he goes and he loses his head. I mean, you can hear Paul's heart if you go into 2 Timothy chapter 4 and you start reading about how he's prepared Timothy, his protege, that he's been mentoring and bringing up, and he says, hey, you know what? I'm already being poured out as a drink offering. He already knew the time of his, of his, of his end was, it was fast approaching. He said, he said, the time of my departure is at hand. And he was excited about the departure, maybe not too excited about how he was departing, but he was excited he was departing. See, he knew he had expended every ounce of energy, every ounce of potential in his life. He poured it out. He literally poured his life's blood out for Jesus. The one who persecuted Christians before he got saved. The ones who watched Stephen be stoned, who was just lifting up Jesus. The one, listen, he had people arrested and killed. That Paul radically changed on the Damascus Road, becomes alive to Jesus Christ, and look, over half of the New Testament is written by the Apostle Paul, who wants persecuted Christians, but ends up giving his life for the very thing that he persecuted. And so, and they want me to go back in front of the camera. Okay, sorry. <laughs> sorry, everybody. As long as you can hear me, Dad, that's good. That's what's important. So think about that. Isn't that it's incredible? This is, this is incredible, the history that we read here, the, the spiritual content of what we see here. And we can relate to it today because we saw those things on television happen with ISIS and Al-Qaeda and everything and our soldiers losing their lives and all this stuff going on, how they persecute. Listen, they would, they would genocide hundreds of thousands of people, their own people. They would gas them and kill them. It didn't matter if you were an adult or a child. It didn't matter. They would do it. Men are evil. An evil man will do, listen, you should not be surprised what an evil man can do. How horrendous is that? And we're in a fight, folks. We're in a fight. So I just want you to get the context of this narrative we're fixing to read right now. Think about ISIS and think about Al-Qaeda when you read this narrative here. And let it speak to your heart this morning about the dire situation, the dire, where they were. Where they were. Ephesians chapter 2, look at verse 11 through 22. Let's read it together. It says, therefore, remember that formerly, he's talking to the Gentiles, understand this, the enemy, right? He's talking to the ones that hate Jews. Remember that formerly you, the Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision, which is performed in the flesh by human hands, Remember that you were at that time separate from Christ, excluding from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But I like the buts, don't you? 
But now, in Christ Jesus, you who formerly were far off have been brought near. By what? By the blood of Christ. For he himself is our what? Peace, who hath made both groups into one and broke down the barrier or the wall of the dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which means hostility, which is the law of commandments contained in ordinances so that in himself he might make the two into one. He's talking about Gentiles and Jews into one new man. Thus establishing what? Peace in the world. And might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross by, by it having put to death the enmity. There's hostility again. And he came and he preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him, Jesus, we both have our access in one spirit, capital S, that's God's spirit, to the Father, God. There's the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. See it? It's there. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints. Amen. Isn't that awesome? He's in prison writing this, and he's in his spirit rejoicing right now as he pins these words. Because he knows, he knows that he knows that he knows that he knows Jesus, and that Jesus spared his life, even though he persecuted other Christians. I'm sure that never left. Stephen, seeing Stephen being stoned to death in a pit never left his mind, although he knew he was forgiven for it. Man, we all have sins that are hard to leave our minds. Sometimes they're there to haunt us, but let me be sure of you, when Jesus covers you with the blood, when you trust him as your Savior, it's like when I take my black wallet that represents sin and I cover it with the red cloth. When God looks at you at salvation, all he sees is the blood of Jesus applied to your life. Amen? Isn't that a beautiful thing? That's all of us. And I love it. It's, I love him. It says here, it says, he says uh, in 19, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens. You know, like this, that's us. We're not, we're not strangers and we're not aliens to him anymore. But you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household. Having been built on the foundation of who? The apostles. He, they laid the foundation, remember? The apostles preaching the word of God. And the prophets. Christ Jesus himself was what? The chief cornerstone. He is the cornerstone in him, in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing. Look at the material of the temple. Being fitted together is growing. The whole temple in the Lord in whom you also are being built. You hear that? You also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. Because when we get to heaven, there's not going to be need of a temple. You know why? Because you and I are his temple. We are the living stones that he puts together. Remember the laminin we showed? Who's the glue that holds all the living stones together? Jesus is that very glue. The laminin, the molecule, the adhesion molecule that holds all of our molecules together. Look it up, laminin. Look it up, laminin. It holds all of our, and it's the shape of a cross. Amen. Just like that. Amazing, amazing thing. God is such a God of order, and he's in order. Always. So it is, we must look at the New Testament in the day as it was written. So the first point we see here is this. You might want to write this on the back of your paper. I'm sorry I didn't have the fill in the blank today. It's been a rather interesting week for Sister Denine and I and Brother Tim because we just got in, we got in our house, closed on our anniversary. Yeah. Brother Eric's in the house. He was our real estate agent that was with us, and man, he took good care of us and so I appreciate him being here today. So awesome. And so God has said, listen, number one, Paul presents the former state of the Gentiles, as I was kind of describing it to you, trying to get you to get a comparison of the dire uh, circumstances of the day. No different than what we deal with with ISIS and Al-Qaeda and anybody else who tries to threaten our lives in horrendous acts of violence and just horrible, horrible things. Hmm. it's amazing that when I think about Jonah Jonah was to go and preach in Nineveh to the Ninevites it's amazing to think about the Afghanistan Iraqi people coming from the same brood of people 
Why didn't why didn't Jonah want to go there? Because he said they were despicable. They were the most torturous people on the planet. He didn't want to go preach them salvation to them. But God got his attention, didn't he not? It just took him going into the belly of a of a fish to realize that he was wrong. <laughs> And turn him around to preach to the Ninevites. But it's something to think about in today's uh, modern where we're at. Paul presents the former state of the Gentiles. Unless you are a Jew, think about this, then you and I are all what? We're all Gentiles, right? Just to show the stark contrast between Jews and Gentiles, think about this now. As, we're, as Jesus was crucified, listen, the first Gentile didn't get saved until 10 years following Jesus' crucifixion. Death, burial, resurrection, and ascension. Ten years later, the first Gentile gets saved. What does that tell you? That tells you that Jesus came for who first? The Jews first. All through the book of Acts, what did Paul do? He went to the Jews first and then to the Gentiles. Eventually, the Jews wouldn't listen. And so he ended up going to the Gentiles exclusively. Yet he still preached the Jews as well. So, so here we are, the Gentile. Ten years later. It was just preached to the Jews. Look at verse 11. Therefore, remember that formerly you, the Gentiles in the flesh, heathens, right, who are called uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision. So you got the uncircumcision Gentiles and you got the circumcision Jews, which is performed in the flesh by human hands. So when we look at this word uncircumcision in this verse of Scripture, I want you to get this here. Uncircumcision, this was not, this was a slur word to all Gentiles. That's how despised they were. All the Romans, despised by the Jews. And that's a slur word to every Gentile, to all of us. It was a slur, it was an offensive word toward each and every one of us by the Hebrews. Listen to the language here, look at verse 14. For he himself, what? Jesus is our peace. Who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh the enmity or hostility of it all. Jesus came with express purpose to say, it's a new day on the globe. Jesus dies on a tree, is raised from the dead, and now what we see is his message is being shared throughout the world. Remember the promise that God made to Abraham? I would, you would, I would bless your nation, and your nation will bless all the nations of the world outside of the Jews. This is the blessing. This is the blessing. Jesus Christ is the blessing who brings everything together as one. As one. Pentecost. Think about Pentecost. There were 16 factions of people, of groups at Pentecost. When the Holy Spirit came upon those 120 that were in the room, filled and full of the Holy Spirit, and they were speaking in tongues, and they were talking to each other, they were speaking different languages to each other so everybody could understand what, was being, what, 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 what God was trying to say through, through the apostles and to everybody else. Well, here's the thing I want you to understand. Those 16 factions were all Jews. No Gentiles. They were all Jews. They came down for the Feast of Weeks, the Harvest Festival. That's what they're there for. And so they're, they're there, and they're, they're there, and, and, so, and so as they go through. So here we go, and, then, and that's, that's at Pentecost. Peter preaches to 5,000 who? Jews. And the Jews get saved in Acts chapter 2. You remember? 5,000 saved. They're all Jews. All of them. They're all Jews. Think about it. Jesus dies, and the placard that's on the cross label, the label that's on the cross, lists him what? As what? King of the what? Of the Jews. <laughs> Think about this. The Ethiopian eunuch was a proselyte. You remember what a proselyte was? A proselyte was one who was not a Jew but wanted to practice Judaism. And the Jews made a provision for that. They told the males they had to be circumcised. They had to be baptized. They had to follow the law in order to be it. And so the Ethiopian eunuch, remember, he came up from Africa. He went to Jerusalem to worship. He's heading back. Remember the story in Acts? He's reading out the book of Isaiah, the prophetic utterances of the prophets in the Old Testament, looking forward to the coming of the Messiah. And he's reading it, and he don't understand it. And who shows up on the scene? Anybody remember who showed up on the scene? Philip. Philip. A, a plus, A plus, A plus. 
Philip shows up on the scene and hears him reading out of the book of Isaiah. He jumps up on the, on the carriage with him and he explains to him, he shares with him who the Messiah is in Jesus Christ and shares the gospel. The Ethiopian open unit gets saved, radically saved. And they just they happened to be right there where there was some water. Not only did he get saved, he got baptized. The Bible says, you read that, it's a, it's a, this could be a movie. So he goes in there, I can see Philip, he's baptizing this Ethiopian eunuch who just received Christ as Savior. And when they come up out of the water, the Bible says he was transliterated out of there and he showed up somewhere else. Philip did. Read it, it's in there. That's pretty wild, man. Can you imagine? I'm here and then I'm not, right? <laughs> that would be wild, man. That's a, that sounds like a movie, right? So anyway, but think about it. I mean, listen, he, listen, he's not, he was the first one. The first convert, really. But yet he was a proselyte Jew, so he was considered as a Jew. But yet he was really like a Gentile who went back to Africa and probably spread the gospel far and wide there as well. You know, we see that. Peter in Joppa has a vision of unclean animals. Remember the unclean animals that came down on the sheet? And the Lord says, says, Peter, take and eat. What did Peter say? Lord, I cannot. I cannot defile myself that way. I cannot do that. I cannot. He is the apostle. So I'm thinking it begged me to ask the question of Peter. Of Peter. Peter, are you merely a Jew? Think about that. Are you merely a Jew? Here's an apostle. Ten years later, he's having trouble with this separation and bringing all people together. He's having a hard time dealing with this. The apostle, just think of the contention between these people groups. A new day has come in Jesus Christ. In Acts 10, 28, listen, listen to what Acts 10, 28 says. It says, and he said to them, all right, you yourselves know how unlawful it is for a man who is a Jew to associate with a foreigner or to visit him. And yet God has shown me that I should not call any man unholy or unclean as one. As one. It's proof that you can be blood bought by Jesus, listen, and still have spiritual blindness. We must be careful to see and to believe in the truth of God's word. Amen? Amen. This is why the apostles went to the different to Samaria, different places. And when they preached the gospel, the Holy Spirit would come on, and the apostles would lay the hands on those that were outside of the Jewish realm. And when he would lay the hands, the Holy Spirit would come in. And then they would go back. And it was a contention time in Jerusalem because the council did not want to hear this. They did not want to hear this. Think about it. It's rooted. It's deep-seated between Gentile and Jew. You just didn't mix. You just did not happen. Through the Old Testament, they weren't allowed to mix with other nations. They weren't supposed to, yet they did. Think about all this. I mean, there's just so much to this. And you can go on forever and ever in this. But it's proof that you can be blood-bought, as Peter was, and can still be blind. Folks, don't be blind. God means what he says in his word, and he says exactly what he means. And we need to heed what he says, right? That means you've got to look at it and read it for yourself. Understand it for yourself. And listen, the gospel mission can overcome today, just as it did in the hardness of yesterday. That's the real message for today. In the first century, the power of the gospel still changes lives this very day. We've seen evidence of that. We've seen the baptisms in the three years we've been here. There's some of you sitting right here I've baptized. And it's awesome. Jesus is our redemption. The second thing we need to see in the scripture, right, in Ephesians, in number two, is Jesus makes all the difference. Jesus makes all the difference. It's all about him. He's the difference maker. He's the one that impacts all of us. Look at verse 13. It says, but now in Christ Jesus, you who formerly were far off have been brought near by what? By the blood of the the lamb, blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace who had made both groups into what? One and broke down the bear of the dividing wall. Every time I see that word dividing wall, you know what it makes me think of? It makes me think of the temple in Jerusalem that when Jesus died on the cross, what tore inside the temple? What tore in the temple? Curtain, man. A 30-foot curtain that was four inches thick. Four inches thick. Four inches thick. Even oxen couldn't rip it apart. 
And it didn't tear from the bottom to top, which if it tore from the bottom to top, then man could have tore it. It tore from the top to the bottom, and only God could have done that. And you know why he did that? He tore that curtain because he said, no more. I'm going to be isolated inside this building for one nation. It's a new day. The Son of God died on a tree, tore the curtain, so that all of us this very day have access directly to the God of our Father, Jesus. What a beautiful thing. We live in the best time we could ever live. The Holy of Holies is in your heart when you know Jesus is Savior. He dwells within. He shows you the way to go. He's the truth, the way, the truth, the life. Listen, he's in you, with you, and upon you. He goes every step, everywhere you go, he goes with you when you're saved. Make sure you take him to the right places. <laughs> it's important. <laughs> so do that, right? So think about this. The dividing wall purchased us. He brings redemption and peace. Listen, no Gentile would be allowed inside the temple area. In fact, that temple area is laid out. I didn't have a picture, but I forgot to put it on there. But there was, a, there was an area. There's, there were several barriers. There were, there were barriers for men, barriers for women. There was a barrier for Gentiles. They could come to the temple, but they couldn't cross the barrier. And archaeologists have found a, actually a sign from the temple area that said, any Gentiles cross this barrier, you will be, uh, you will be killed. <laughs> they actually have, a, have that sign in one of the museums over there. That they will, you would be killed, executed. And so they didn't cross into that. If they were discovered there, they would be killed. Paul, if you remember at the end of the book of Acts, is accused of bringing a Gentile into the temple area behind the wall. And they wanted to put him to death for it. Look at verse 15. By abolishing in his flesh the enmity or hostility, which is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so that in himself he might make the two into one man, thus establishing peace and might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross, by it having put to death the enmity or hostility. He, Jesus, is our peace. He, Jesus, is our liberty. He is our unity. Not two, but what? But one with the Father. One man with one body. Listen, no dividing wall ever again. Jesus has made the difference. Look at verse 17. What did he say? And it says, and he came and preached peace to you and were far, who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him, Jesus, we both have our access in one spirit to the Father. Notice, not Paul saying this, but Paul said, that, but the spirit of Jesus is speaking here. The spirit of Jesus is speaking in this very verse right here. Verse 17, Jesus came and preached peace to you. Not, not I, Paul, or Peter, but Jesus. Maybe through Paul and Peter. But nonetheless, it's always Jesus. He's always speaking to you and to me. Whether we read the word, somebody shares it with us. Jesus is speaking. And never forget that church is so important. So here's a question I have for us today. This is a good place to ask yourself, do you or are you holding any grudge on someone who needs to hear Jesus' gospel? Maybe it's a family member you're not talking to. Maybe a former friend or acquaintance that has been an enemy to you. Listen, we are one race. We are one culture, for we all have common access to him. Jesus, these attitudes must change. We are one in Jesus. We must learn to, what, forgive. So, it's so important, everybody, to forgive, 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 for we all have access to Jesus. Everyone has the same access to holy Jesus. I don't care what color you are. I don't care what ethnicity you are, what geographical location you're from. We all have equal access. There's only one Jesus, and he's the only way to God is through him. And we need to remember that. When you're, when you're talking with people from other backgrounds and other nations and other places, they're made in the image of God just like you. They just look a little different. I like a God that has a lot of character. Right? He sprinkles all these things. Makes it exciting to change it up every now and then, right? It does. We must learn to forgive, which my final point comes to this. Number three, because of Jesus, we all have a common access to him. We all have a common access to him. Verse 18. For through him we both have our access, there it is, in one spirit to the Father. Here's the Trinity again. 
So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow, what? Citizens with the saints and are of God's household. When Jesus came, listen, he changed everything. He raised the bar. This is a whole new humanity. It's a whole new thing. Jesus is the doorway to heaven. He is the only doorway to heaven. He changed everything. That's why he changed it. Now it's not, you know, they, they were trying to be keepers of the law. The Jews were. They couldn't keep the law. And Jesus even raised the bar. He said, he said if you think, if you think on a woman to lust after her, he said, you've committed adultery already in your heart. Amen. He said, if you hate your brother, you've committed murder in your heart. He raised the bar. When Jesus came, he, he, didn't, he didn't diminish the law. He fulfilled the law. And not only did he fulfill the law, he raised the bar even higher. So what you think matters. And when you think, you commit sin. You run that through your mind, you commit sin. You play act it out in your mind, what you want to do, and you know it ain't right. Then you committed sin. You need to ask Jesus to forgive you. That's for somebody out here, including me. It is. Because of Jesus, we all have common access. He has brought all things of all people of the world together, one, period. That's what Jesus has done. All this stuff we're seeing in the news, all this, these factions of people that are fighting and protesting and different things and Democrats. Listen, all that is a bunch of hoodoo garbage. Listen, that's the world. And we're not of the world. We live in it. We follow the laws of the land because God ordained the laws for us to follow. But listen, they're living in the world. They're living in the world. They live in a temporary place that's going to be burned up one day. Not you. Not you. And with the material of the new temple is being built in our bodies. A whole new humanity, family, and purpose inside of us. Look at Romans 5, 20, 21. It says, the law came in so the transgression would, be, would increase. It increases because the law reveals your sin. Without the law, you don't even have no idea. That's why the Ten Commandments are so vital. The Ten Commandments help us to realize our sin that we're committing. Without no law, how do we know what sins we are committing? And I still think that God had a way for us to know that we were committing sin. The Bible says if you break one of the Ten Commandments, it says you've broken all of them. So you got to think about this. The law was important, but it leads us to who? To realize that we are guilty and helpless, and we need what? Jesus, and we need to go to the cross. Flood to the cross. Go to the cross. That's the whole point of the law. The whole point. The law came so the transgression would increase, but where sin increased, right? Look what happens. When sin increases, what else increases? Grace. Grace abounded all, the more, so that as sin reigned in death, even so grace would reign through righteousness to eternal life. Through who? Through who? Not through any man, not through any person, but one person, one man, one God man, one perfect unblemished man, and that man is Jesus Christ our Lord. He's our Lord, whether you believe it or not. The Bible says that one day, every knee is going to bow, every tongue is going to confess Jesus as Lord. You're either saved, saved or lost. You're going to confess Jesus as Lord. Just don't let it be everlasting too late for you because you don't believe and you're confessing him as Lord and it's too late to change your direction. You can't change it once you leave this world. Eternity is forever. You're solidified here. Life is like going through a doorway. This doorway, you've seen me do this before. You got a door, I'm going off camera, I'm sorry. Hey, folks, I'm going over to a doorway, and life is like this doorway. You open it up. This is one side of life. <laughs> you walk through to the other side. Let me tell you how important the hinge is. See that hinge right here? Jesus is the hinge of our life. It's the hinge hanging on the door. Jesus is our hinge. The cross is the hinge pin of history. He is the hinge pin of history for you and for me and for the whole world. It's a beautiful, beautiful picture if you see it this morning. Folks, we must forgive others. You got people you're not forgiven. Who is your greatest enemy today? Would you forgive them? If you haven't, you need to. You ever heard of a guy by the name of Louis Sampini? Let me see a hand. Anybody have a hand? Louis Sampini. 
What a tremendous story, man. There's a movie called Unbroken. I would highly recommend you watch Unbroken. I mean, it's hard. It's not easy. I'm telling you. It's not easy what this man endured. But this young man grew up as a, rebellion, a rebel. Man, he did all kinds of, he got in all kinds of trouble. He was in gangs. He did whatever he wanted, when he wanted, how he wanted. He was in trouble. In fact, he got arrested. He got, as a teenager, he got arrested. And while he was in jail, listen, a policeman said, hey, listen, you know, you need to do something besides what you're doing because what you're doing is going to lead you to penitentiary. And if you don't change, then listen, then your life's going to be destroyed. And so you know what he does? They recommend him to go try out for track at his high school. So he tries out for track at his high school, right? The dude breaks the state record in the mile. He is so fast, nobody is even close to this guy. Not even close to this young man. Louis Zampini. Unbelievable. Nobody's even close. So then he goes to college. He breaks every record. Man, he gets on the Olympic team. This is in 1936. In 1936, Louis Zambini is on the Olympic track team to go race in none other place but in the Berlin Olympics. In Berlin, Hitler's in reign and rule in Berlin, in Germany. And so here, Zampini's over there, he's running the race. He didn't win the race, by the way. I think he finished like eighth place. But let me tell you why, because he shares, he shared why he didn't win the race. He said, you know, he said, they put me on a boat in America to send me over there. It was like, I forget how many days, two-week trip or whatever it was to get over. In fact, Oscar, you could probably tell a little story about that. So it takes a long time to get across by boat. He said, you know what? They fed me real good on that boat. And he said, I gained 14 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> kind of hard to run with 14 pounds. I don't know. I know. I know it's hard for me to run now with this 200 none of your business pounds. <laughs> you hear me? So I want you to think about that, all right? So 14 pounds, he's running the Olympics, he placed eighth. You know, he got to shake Hitler's hand, which is not a, a prideful thing. I wouldn't want to shake his hand. Back then, they didn't know everything that was really going on in the world. But Hitler asked for him to come up. He wanted to see him after the race. You know why? Because he was, even though he finished eighth, the last lap, they said he ran so fast, he broke the world record in one lap of running around that track. He ran one lap in 56 seconds. And he so ran so fast that Hitler took notice of how fast he came up through the ranks running that last lap. He could not believe what he saw, and he wanted to meet him. He, of course, got a lot of grief over that, went on with his life, famous. He got being famous because of that. And then next thing, uh, he joins the military. He's in the Army. He flies on a uh, bomber uh, over in Japan, fast forward to World War II. Uh, they crash in the ocean outside of Japan. Uh, he's on a raft for 40 days with three other men. One of them die, one of them lives. He's captured by the Japanese. He's tortured horrendously for a long time by the Japanese, so much so that when he is finally freed and he survives and he's freed, he comes back to America. He comes back to America to his lovely bride, uh, and then he kind of literally brings her through a living hell because he can't forget what he's been through in the torture chambers of an individual that was in there named the bird who tortured him mercilessly, tortured him uh, beyond anything you could probably even imagine. I'm sure he wouldn't even talk about specifics about it at all. I'm going to tell you this real, folks. There are evil people that would do some of the most heinous things in people's lives. And this man came back home, lost, didn't know Jesus. Didn't know Jesus. And his wife begged him, asked him if he would go to a Billy Graham crusade. Amen. He goes to, Joanne can relate. <laughs> That's where she got saved, Billy Graham. Praise the Lord. He goes to a Billy Graham crusade, gets radically saved. And it's amazing what he does. And I want you to watch this clip of Mr. Sampini as he's interviewed. When you went back to Japan, you, you shared the gospel with some of the very guards that mistreated you and you wanted to meet the bird, but you were told the bird was dead. He wasn't, but you didn't know that at the time. But you wrote him a letter. 
Do you have that letter with you? I, I, yeah, I brought it with me. This is the letter that Louis wrote to the bird. You want me to read it? No, would you okay. read it, please? <laughs> okay. This is to Master Cheryl Watanabe. As a result of my further war experience under your unwarranted and original punishment, my quote, warlike became a nightmare. I, it was not so much due to the pain and suffering as it was to the tension of stress and humiliation that caused me to hate with a vengeance. Under your discipline, my rights not only as a prisoner but also as a human being were stripped from me. It was a struggle to maintain enough dignity and hope to live under the war's end. The post-war nightmare caused my life to crumble. But thanks to a confrontation with God through the evangelist Billy Graham, I committed my life to Christ. Love replaced the hate I had for you, and Christ even said, forgive your enemies and pray for them. As you probably know, I returned to Japan in 1952 and was graciously allowed to address all the Japanese war criminals at Tsugamo Prison. I asked them about you and was told that you probably had committed Hari Kiri, which I was sad to hear. At that moment, like the others, I also forgave you, and now I would hope that you would also become a Christian. Amen. That's uh, forgiveness. So, <laughs> tell me you can't forgive. You know, I have another story of God by the name of, listen, a chaplain by the name of Henry Gorecki. He's from uh, St. Louis, Missouri. He was in the Army. He was a chaplain in the Army during World War II. And listen to this. Following World War II, this chaplain during the time of Nuremberg trials, y'all know what the Nuremberg trials were? The men, the Nazis, who committed the atrocities against the 63 million people who were destroyed by the Nazis. Listen, they had a trial in Nuremberg. I've actually been in the physical building where that trial took place. It was kind of personal to me when I think about this story about this chaplain. You know what this chaplain's task was? The chaplain was uh, his whole thing. Henry had a heart for these 22 men who were being held trial. This is, these are 22 men that every person on the planet would want dead when they would hear the atrocities that were done. And they would want to see them in hell. But this chaplain, I want you to listen to this. Henry had a heart for these men's souls. And the judgment they would face knowing they would be found guilty of their crimes and face the death penalty. He and a Catholic priest began to minister to these 22 criminals over a period of time about their souls when all the world would want them dead deserving of hellfire. But an amazing thing happened while Henry could have gone home. See, Henry had the choice to go home from the war and be with his wife, but he chose to stay because the souls of those men were valuable enough to him because he knew the value of a soul to God is everything. No matter what we've done, we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God, right? Amen. And so when we look at this now, listen to this story. This is an amazing story. And so, and so he, he wanted to stay on three additional years ministering to these. Three additional years to stay on and minister to these men. There were rumors that Henry's wife was calling for his return home to her. Listen to what happened. This is what happened. These 22 men wrote a letter and sent it directly to her. All 22 of them signed the letter. And I want to read this letter to you. Let me read it to you. This is amazing. In June of 1946, Alma Gorecki received a most remarkable letter at her St. Louis home. It was from Germany where her husband, a Lutheran church, Missouri Synod pastor, was stationed. It was postmarked Nuremberg and signed, actually by 21, 20, but 21 of the most notorious men in the world at the time. Former members of the Nazi party who were on trial for war crimes, they wrote because a rumor was circling that her husband, Henry, who had served them as chaplain, was to be given the opportunity to return home before their trial ended. They wrote asking Alma to allow Henry to remain until their fate was determined by the international court. Alma didn't hesitate and wrote telling her husband to stay and finish his ministry with these men. Faith and obedience to Christ, who said that even one's enemies deserve to be cared for spiritually 
motivated her as it had her husband Henry. As did the fact these men, most of whom would be convicted and sentenced to die for the human suffering they helped orchestrate, could write this. And this is what they wrote. This is what these prisoners wrote. For all Gorecki, for all Gorecki, our dear chaplain, is necessary for us not only as a minister, but also as thoroughly a good man that he is. Surely we need not describe him as such to his own wife. We simply have come, listen to this, we simply have come to love him. To love him. It is impossible for any other man than him to break through the walls that have been built up around us in a spiritual sense even stronger than a material one. Therefore, please leave him with us. Certainly you will bring this sacrifice and we shall be deeply indebted to you. We send you our best wishes for you and your family. God be with you. Now how does one respond to a letter that expresses something one does not ordinarily associate with architects of the Third Reich? Love. Think about that, love. There is only one way. Through Christ. Through Christ. About the same time as the Nuremberg Trials, English writer C.S. Lewis wrote a book entitled Mere Christianity. In it, Lewis wrote, everyone says forgiveness is a lovely idea until they have something to forgive. <laughs> Isn't that true? As we had during the war. <laughs> and then to mention the subject at all is to be met with howls of anger. I wonder how you would feel about forgiving the SS if you were a Pole or a Jew. To which Lewis offered a very candid admission. He was not writing to say what he could do, but what Christianity is and what God can do and has done. And right in the middle of Christianity, Lewis positioned Luke chapter 6, verses 27 to 38, which basically says, I tell you who hear me, love your enemies. So I'm going to leave you with this thought today. You can put that up, Danny. Always pray to have eyes that see the best in people. A heart that forgives the worst. A mind that forgets the bad. And a soul that never loses faith in God ever. Just leave that up for the rest of the service, brother. Isn't that so true? So I want to ask you a question. Who have you not forgiven that you need to forgive? Who do you need to forgive? If those men can forgive these men who committed these things, who are we not to forgive? Jesus hung on a cross and forgave all of us. And he didn't need to do that. But he did it because he loves you so much. In fact, it was the only way for us to be saved. He gave his life a ransom for all of our lives. Who's ever done that for you today that you know of? Jesus did that for all of you. He did that for me. And by his grace and mercy, we live, breathe, and we live. Why can we not dedicate our lives to serving a risen Savior who gave his life as a ransom for you and for me? That we would, listen, that we would go and share the good news of Jesus Christ to the world. My whole theme for 2021 is reaching 2021. You all probably read what I had in the, in the Sunday paper. I want you to take that home and I want you to sit down and I want you to pray about how you can impact 2021 with the very life that you have left. Now remember, folks, Moses didn't even start till he was how old? 80. <laughs> 80. We got to get busy because there's a whole neighborhood out here that needs Jesus. There's a whole community. Hernando, Lacano, Pine Ridge, Citrus Hills needs Jesus. And who's going to tell them? If you guys don't tell them, who's going to tell them? I can't tell all of them. But I'm telling you to help me 
Let's join forces together. Let's, let's do what we do. Like the live nativity, we shared the gospel to 168 cars. Inside those cars, I don't know how many people. There were multiple of people inside those cars. Some children, some young people, some older people. Listen, they were there. They heard the gospel. They saw the gospel being proclaimed and preached to them in a simple way. And all of that were part of that is a jewel in your crown for those that get saved from it. It's just a jewel in your crown, period, because you stood up there and you did it and shared the gospel. Even if you dug a post hole to put the, put the, the mural in. Isn't that beautiful? That's how we share the gospel together. Hills Church, I want it to be known to transform this whole world, this whole area. Beverly Hills needs to be transformed. And listen, you're the people, and you're the people online, and the people here that can do it, and we will do it. But listen, it takes all of us a radical, humble obedience to learn about Jesus as much as you can and to put in practice what you learn about Jesus every day that you can until God takes the breath and be like Paul. Go to the end of your life. You have no more left to give except your blood. Don't go to your grave full of potential. In the graves are people who never lived out their potential. And they went to, I mean, there were people who were the great men and women that could have been great men and women of God who never found out and used the potential. And they went, they went half full, three quarters full, sometimes 100% full of potential that they never used. Paul went to the grave empty. Jesus on the cross, what did he say when he gave his blood? What did he say? It is what? And he says he gave up his breath and he gave up all of his blood. He had, listen, on earth he had no more potential to give. At that time he gave everything. His potential was to save you and me. And that's exactly what he did. And when he did that, it's awesome. Our lives should be examples of what we see in the scriptures of these men. Most of the disciples gave their lives as martyrs. Christianity isn't a feel-good Rose garden, rose bed of roses sometimes. It's, it's, it's a hard life. You're going you're gonna to have conflict in your life. You're going to have people come against you because they're going to think you're a fruitcake and you're weird and you're stupid. And how do you believe that junk? I've, I've heard it all. <laughs> but I know how God radically changed my life and heart. And so does that woman. She knows how God changed my life at 27. Every head bowed and every eye closed. So I would want you to consider your soul. No looking around. It's your soul. If you died right now, if your breath left you and your heart stopped beating right now, where will you spend eternity? With Jesus or apart from Jesus? I don't know your heart, but Jesus knows your heart, and he can speak to your heart right now, and I pray that he is. Get your heart right before you leave. It's simple. Believe that Jesus died on a cross for you, shed his blood for you, to wash away your every sin. Ask him right now, just in your own mind, ask that Jesus come into my heart, wash my sins away. Today, I believe you died for me. I believe you were buried for me. I believe you rose from the dead just for me. Lord, I don't know. All, that's all I know. I don't know anything else, Lord, but I do believe that you died for my sin. Come into my life and change me right now. Listen, he'll change you right where you sit. Ask him into your heart. Start off 2021 with life everlasting this morning. Ask him into your heart. Say, Jesus, forgive me for all my sin. I believe in you. Help me to turn around from what I'm doing that's wrong and let me turn and do an about face and chase after you, Jesus, with all my heart. I know you're the way, the truth, and the life now today. And I trust you with all my life. Lord Jesus, I thank you for touching all of us here today. Lord, as a Christians that are many Christians that are here, I pray, Lord, that there's Somebody out there they haven't forgiven. That, Lord, they don't hesitate. Lord, they've heard a word from God. They're going to be held accountable for the word that they've heard. All of us are. Every time we hear it, we're accountable to you. Help them to go. Give them the courage and the strength and the know-how and the wisdom 
the knowledge and understanding of what they need to do to make it right with their family members, friends, or whoever they have a grudge against. And tear down the walls, the dividing wall. If they don't accept it, you can't help that. But we have to do our part. Because, Lord, you have told us in your word to do that. Lord Jesus, I thank you for this time together. I praise you for it all. For it's in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to tell you something. If you made a decision to receive Christ as Savior, I'm going to be right up here on this step. And I would love to know that so I can tell you and rejoice with you and tell you what to do next. The rest of you, have a great rest of the day. Let this sink in, man. Go, it's online on, on YouTube. Go on, you can go back there and make sure you get your notes filled in and everything. But Happy New Year. It's a great way to start the new year. Amen? Amen? Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say what? Rejoice. I love y'all. God bless you. Thank you.